Our next speaker is, in fact, George Andrews from Penn State University, and he'll talk about Dick Askey in India. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This is a day both of celebrating Richard Askey. It also has melancholy aspects for many of us who, who were his good friend for decades, who knew him uh, well, and uh, uh, the fact that he's gone is hard, most of us, to assimilate because he was such a, a major presence. In order to set the stage for, for uh, Dick in India, I need to uh, go back really to the beginning of my relationship with him. So we, we really started corresponding about things in the early 1970s because of my study of partitions working on Q. And uh, Dick was uh, heavily into uh, special functions. Uh, one of the papers that I wrote related to the Q Appel polit functions uh, rather surprised Dick, and that was really the start of our uh, correspondence. Uh, he ran a special session at Northwestern in 1972, and that was where we met for the first time. I, again, still talking about a Q, and Dick very much concentrated on special functions, but uh, a comment I made on the relationship between uh, Henry Gould's compendium of of binomial coefficients and the fact that it was mostly a few results from hypergeometric series uh, struck a chord with Dick and really started this long-term friendship. At that time, I had discovered that what Big Dick called well-poised hypergeometric series, the Q analogs of well-poised hypergeometric series, were very important in partitions. And Dick had observed the same sort of importance in special functions, indeed solving the problem of the connection coefficients between two families of, of Jacobi polynomials led him to uh, uh, the Watson uh, or the Whipple uh, transformation. And I had been led to the Q analog of it in the study of partitions. So he invited me to the CBMS conference in 1974, and our uh, mutual interest in things uh, was picking up substantially. Again, he invited me to his 1975 special functions uh, uh, major conference in Madison, and the year 75-76, he invited me to spend the year at, at, the, um, at the Wharf Foundation, and we agreed that our sort of confluence of interests suggested that we should look, spend the year basically on a seminar devoted to the work of Wolfgang Hahn, who had looked at Q analogs of classical polynomials, including the Q Jacobi polynomials. And this would be form the focus of this seminar. As a result of this year, the year we planned to write a book on special functions that would combine both the ordinary case and the Q case. And uh, eventually the book special functions did occur, uh, but this is, only 1999 when it actually occurred, although we'd agreed to write it in 1976. Uh, each of us, for one reason or another, put it on back burners. I actually wrote three chapters early on, which are here in manuscript form, and didn't make the final cut that was actually published by Cambridge. Fortunately for us, Ranjan Roy, uh, <clears throat> was inter very interested in this and, and basically joined us and was the moving force that actually finally got special functions uh, published. In any event, our collaboration in 1975-76 was coincident with, in the spring of 1976, I attended a couple of conferences in Europe, and to my good fortune, found what is now called the Ramanujan Lost Notebook in the Trinity College Library in Cambridge. 
and took a copy of it back to Madison to share with Dick. And this sort of spurred interest in Ramanujan and Ramanujan's work. Uh, in 19, early 1980s, I went to India and had a chance to visit Mrs. Ramanujan, Ramanujan's widow, who lived into her 90s. Uh, and there were stories about this in the, in the New York Times and in the Hindu. And in the Hindu article, Ramanujan's widow said that nothing had been done to really commemorate Ramanujan. There were no statues or busts or anything like that, which knowing Dick and his enthusiasm for things caused him to, to Commission Paul Granland, the uh, the sculptor who of whom Dick had bought several pieces, to to do a bust of Ramanujan, and so this is sort of show and tell day, and so I hope that everybody can see the bust of Ramanujan um, right there. So this is the Granland bust. I would have held it close to the to the camera, but it is very heavy, so it's going to have to sit there. In any event, uh, this was, Dick commissioned this, basically provided the financial backing in case it didn't sell, although Dick was confident it would sell. There were 10 copies of the bust made, and indeed all of them uh, sold so that he lost no money on this. It was uh, a, a something that that caught the imagination of many people and uh, and certainly uh, made a significant uh, impression on uh, on people in addition to what was then becoming Dick's major output with regard to uh, with regard to the the work of Ramanujan he had uh, in his words caught the Q disease oh so now I hope to really start talking about uh, India and the, uh, let me see here, where, here we are. I should tell you that there were actually, um, I think, uh, a total of eight conferences in, in India and Sri Lanka. Uh, Dick attended six of them and I attended seven of them. The only one Dick missed that I went to was Gorakhpur. The one in Colombo and uh, Sri Lanka, neither of us went to. And uh, we were rather pleased that we had not gone in that after the conference, Larry Washington, who had gone, reported to us that he and a colleague reckoned they, that five minutes earlier, they had been standing at the portion of the train station where the explosive blew up. So uh, we felt that probably, at, at least I had promised my wife that if she would let me go to India, I would not go to uh, Sri Lanka where there was significant uh, uh, civil unrest. In any event, the first major conferences started in the south of India. There were three in Madras, and uh, one of the people most responsible for, for hosting things in Madras, now Chennai, was um, Aladi Ramakrishnan. And um, this is a picture of the, uh, the home of the of Aladi Ramakrishnan, whose son Krishna Swami Aladi is professor at the University of Florida and also a great friend and great admirer of Richard Askey. One of the things that Aladi Ramakrishnan did was to hold public uh, lectures as, and to invite a, a heterogeneous audience of people who were part of the intellectual world, but not necessarily mathematicians. And Dick was asked to give a talk to, to this group. And here you see in the home of Aladi Ramakrishnan, behind Dick's shoulder is the grandfather, who was one of the major players in, it was a lawyer who was a major player in writing the Indian constitution when they uh, uh, got their freedom from Great Britain. 
So Dick is, is here. I hope the arrow sees him. I am right over here. It looks to me at that stage of things that jet lag had, uh, had affected me because uh, Dick is well known for having go, gone to sleep in lectures, but I'm afraid it looks like I had gone to sleep in this lecture. <laughs> However, you can see this is the same uh, circumstance. The photo is now slightly different, and you see significant concern on my face. I'm not looking at Dick at all. I'm looking actually to behind me. The reason is that sitting behind me was a European mathematician, whom I shan't name for reasons which will become obvious, who quite clearly had arrived in Madras and had gone straight from the airport to Dick's talk, and he went sound asleep. And unfortunately, he snored horribly loudly at sort of in intervals that were not regular. And it was clear to me after a little while that it was uh, starting to distract Dick as he was giving his talk. And so I looked around to see what was happening. And indeed, there was this gentleman absolutely sound asleep, sitting between two Indians, who are the politest people on the face of the earth. They would never think of uh, awakening anybody. And so I turned around in my seat, reaching back. I shook this man who almost a volcanic explosion of snoring uh, emerged from him with that, but he woke up and Dick was able to continue the talk without too much difficulty. This next picture is Aladi Ramakrishnan with Dick immediately after the talk. Um, the conference, the first conference that we attended in Madras was at Anamala University. Here is a picture from the cover of the Hindu, of the Indian Express. Uh, part of this meeting was to honor Mrs. Ramanujan and uh, the customary uh, uh, greeting was to place a shawl on her shoulders. And that's what I am doing, as you see right there. Notice that Dick is over on the right and notice the most most amazing thing is Dick has a tie on so that we can be absolutely sure of how significant he viewed this event of honoring Mrs. Ramanujan to actually show up in a tie. I've actually, I think, only seen him in a tie at one other event in the many years I knew him. So this was at one of the major events where, where uh, both Dick and I spoke, and it was uh, that done to honor Mrs. Ramanujan. Madras, Chennai, uh, we went south to get to a conference in Kumbakonam. Um, as I uh, mentioned, there were, uh, there were uh, several conferences eventually held in Madras, uh, but there was one in Kumbakonam. Kumbakonam is the town in which uh, Ramanujan grew up, and we are standing in front of the town high school, which is the high school where Ramanujan went to high school, and uh, one of the lecture halls is named after him, and uh, we got the, uh, among the prized possessions there are the certificates of merit that Ramanujan won for winning various mathematics contests in the high school. I especially treasure this photo because it has both Liz and Dick on the left. There is me, there is Bruce Barrett and Basil Gordon, and then our hosts from, uh, from, from the Ronagen High School are on the right. I should mention that in Robert Canigal's uh, biography of Ramanujan, he refers to Dick, me, and Bruce as the gang of three, to which Dick has responded that this is the result of two notebooks and a bust. Um, so this, this uh, conference in Kumbakonam, uh, after this, we went by car from Kumakonam back to uh, Madras to the big uh, international conference that was to be held. 
the way back, we passed a factory where the workers were on strike and had gathered by the highway in large numbers, waving communist flags. And our two cars, the front car can, composed me, Bruce, and Basil Gordon, and the last car, Dick and Liz, and maybe one other mathematician, I'm not sure, uh, perhaps the Brasseuse. In any event, uh, the, the strikers stopped the cars and demanded, according to our driver, wanted money. And uh, Basil Gordon and Bruce started looked slightly confused and fooling around. I felt we had to do something quickly. So I hauled out a five rupee note and passed it through the driver to the strikers who were so pleased, surprisingly to me, because it in dollars, that was about 20 cents. Uh, they, that they not only let our car go through, but they let Richard Askey's car go through without charging them any money. And so Richard Askey never let me forget that I'm the most conservative mathematician he knows, and I'm the only one who's contributed money to the Communist Party of India. <laughs> Back in, uh, in Madras, there was the big conference went on where Rajiv Gandhi, the then Prime Minister of India, uh, uh, kicked off the conference. And as you see here, uh, this is from the front page of the Hindu. Uh, Gandhi is standing, speaking on the left, and Mrs. Ramanujan is is seated on the dais. So this day was also the day that the Narosa publication of the Ramanujan Lost Notebook, which originally came out looking like this. I hope everybody can see this. Um, this was the day uh, that it was released to the public. <clears throat> and I had been asked to write the introduction to it. So uh, the in the middle of the of the presentation, Rajiv Gandhi was to give to me uh, co a copy of the notebook. Uh, shall we say, I don't know that I did exactly the right thing, but I wanted the gang of three to each have a copy of this notebook actually signed uh, by Gandhi. And so I had three copies of it, which I took on stage, perhaps a little confounding Gandhi, but he nonetheless happily signed all three. Indeed, the one he's signing right now is the one that was for me. The one on the bottom is the one that I was in intending to give to Dick. When I, when, when the preceding, proceedings were over and I emerged from the stage with these three uh, things, which were signed both by Rajiv Gandhi and Mrs. Ramanujan. Uh, I handed, I had one for me, I handed one to Bruce. And as I was handing one to Dick, a government agent came up, grabbed it and said, this will be very nice for the Department of Defense at which time I melted down because uh, I had not intended anything for the Department of Defense. This was to be Richard Askey's copy of the uh, Lost Notebook. Uh, and, but fortunately for me and perhaps international relations, Dick intervened saying that he didn't really need the copy of the Lost Notebook signed by a mere politician. And so, uh, uh, the, the a government agent promised me that he would get another copy of this signed by Gandhi and, uh, and sent, to, uh, sent to Dick. Uh, at the time, I did not believe him, but uh, he nonetheless uh, said that that was the case. And indeed, a month later, uh, I was able to present Dick with the signed copy so that he actually got it, even though it was by a very circuitous route. Uh, so um, I hope that Anyway, what happened after that conference was sort of the big dramatic event of the, uh, the trip in India, because I, if anybody can see this picture, I hope, uh, 
It is a headline from the Hindu, MGR passes away. Who was MGR? He was the premier of Tamil Nadu and was sort of a very populist uh, Juan Peron type of uh, personage. And when he passed away, riots broke out and the demands by the public that nobody drive or move anywhere. And all of us were trapped in our hotels for three days and, uh, and wondering whether we would ever get out of Madras again. Eventually, after three days, uh, all of us were allowed to leave, both the ASCIIs and I went on to the conference on Pune. Uh, the only person I know who got out before us was R.P. Agarwal, who was then a vice chancellor at, in a major university in the north, and as a result, he had to, uh, he at 2 a.m., he and his wife, lying on the floor of a taxi cab with no lights on, threaded their way through Madras to the airport. But eventually, at the Askis and I got to Pune, uh, where the, the next to last conference occurred. And finally, the final conference uh, in India at that time occurred in, uh, in, uh, in Bombay, now Mumbai, at the Tata Institute. So basically, uh, this was a, an, op a, an opportunity for both Dick and me to, to talk at length about Ramanujan. Uh, Dick's work mostly related to his, the aspects of special functions that he would talk about. I mostly spent talking about items from the Lost Notebook. Uh, Although this is, of course, just related to the 1987 trip, I should mention that in uh, 2012, uh, both Dick, Bruce Berndt, and I were united again in conferences in India. And uh, that was when the, the three of us were awarded honorary degrees at Shastra University, which which houses the Ramanujan Prize that is given any, every year to someone who works in areas related to Ramanujan and who is 32 years of age or, or uh, younger because 32 is the age at which Ramanujan died. So that I think pretty well covers the things that I wanted to, to say, or at least uh, covers the things that I could say about, uh, about Dick in, uh, in India. So I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, question is for George. George, can you tell us what Dick talked about at those popular lectures? For example, the one where you went to sleep? Well, that's the problem, isn't it, Dennis, that I went to sleep. And also I had the problem of the large disruption behind yes. me. But so well, basically it was a it was on the the inspiration that Ramanujan provides. I don't re there the possibility of saying much mathematically was rather limited because there was, I think, a whiteboard available, but uh, but we were still in the age of, of, of overhead transparencies, and there were, he did not have overhead transparencies. So it was basically a historical uh, uh, account. Yeah, may, may I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, yeah, Liz uh, writes in her Indian diary about uh, your popular lecture maybe at the same place. Yes, it was and, at the same place. And yes. um, that you did, that you were also a magician, that you did a card trick. See, see, see that, <laughs> basically, everybody knows there's an old card trick, where which is just a number game. Uh, so it relies on the, the fact that the binomial representation of numbers. So you basically have cards with numbers between one and 100 on them. Somebody's supposed to think of a number. You show them each card and ask them if the, their card, their number is on that card. And then basically, the cards that they answer yes to, the upper left-hand corner has the powers of two that add up to that number. Uh, 
So that is basically the uh, the card trick that I went through. The object was to lead in to a simple aspect of the theory of partitions. So namely uh, Euler's theorem that the number of partitions into odd parts equals the number of partitions into distinct parts. And that's easy, easily done using this fact that every number has a unique binary representation. I have refined the card trick. I think you can actually find discussions of it on the web somewhere by using another theorem that says that every number is uniquely a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So if you do that sort of ver version, then each time somebody answers yes, you then are able to tell them that their number is not on the next card, which adds a certain flair to the whole thing. But that's the extent of my magician powers. Just for George. You say about this Indian diary by, by Liz. So it, it's on the web. So, so, so I recommend everybody to read it. It's very interesting. Yes, absolutely. She, uh, she was fascinated. By, by the country, by the people, by the culture, but she she tried to understand, but she didn't succeed. That that's her conclusion. The questions or comments for George? Okay, George, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The testimonial period. If someone would like to share things about Ishao, yes. It seems that we have a time for testimonials, an open space for time. For anyone to make a testimonial about Dick, do we have any volunteers? Sure, go ahead, Morad. Okay. Um, when I went to medicine in 1974, I just graduated. And when I got to medicine, what uh, Dick told me, you know, I was supposed to be there for one year. So Dick said that, you know, during this year, what I read, you know, I'm writing this book on special functions and you know, I wanted to sort of like create things, you know, see if any criticism or comments or something like that. And interestingly enough, he said that sort of the classical special functions are, are just, the theory is now complete because the major problem that was left is the addition theorem for Jacobi polynomials. And this has been done. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, within a couple of years or something, we uh, should find something else to do. So it was very interesting because at that time, it was really believed that the sort of classical special functions, there's the theory is sort of complete. But what was interesting is that during the year, he started asking, you know, these combinatorial questions and, and these other things, and then his correspondence with George, you know, started to get him into Q series. And we were also supposed to write a paper on quadratic transformations. But we had so many other things to do that at, by the end of the year, Dick didn't write anything about that book. And the quadratic transformation paper was never written. Uh, but we did all kinds of other things. And you know, this uh, MRC symposium that he held in 1975, uh, 1975 was amazing. I mean, uh, George was there, Bruce Burns. Uh, Willard Miller. Willard Miller, Ken Case, uh, uh, Tom Cornwinder. Um, Ted Chihara. Uh, Ted, Ted Chihara, but Ted Chihara did not talk. But, you know, the speakers, Carlin and McGregor. I mean, it was... And, uh, you know, with this kind of conference, it was clear that the subject is really not a closed chapter anymore. It's actually wide open. And, and, and then the following year, of course, uh, George spent in medicine and the whole scenery changed completely. I mean, and then we had all these great developments that happened. So it was, it was a very interesting experience for me. Anybody else want to offer something? So I have a question for Murad. Uh, so uh, were you there at the same time, Dennis? Were you a student at that time? I was a student when Murad was there, yes. And, and Jim Wilson also. Jim Wilson was there. I'll, I'll talk about that this afternoon. And Dick had another student, Dan Moak, who wrote a thesis in special functions. He was there then. Okay. Can I say something? Sure, go ahead. 
Hello, Dennis. So I used to laugh when uh, Dick told me that um, people had felt that they, the age of special functions was over. I told him that from my perspective as a mathematical statistician, there were many, many problems that as far as I could see could only be attacked using special functions. And so I told him that I, I, I was just shocked that people could ever think that special functions was, was dormant and would never recover. And in fact, um, a few years ago, there was this famous conjecture, the Gaussian correlation conjecture, which people had, um, it was formulated in the, mid, in the mid 1950s. And it arose from a purely statistical problem, trying to construct 95% confidence intervals. And people tried really hard uh, to solve this problem. And it wasn't solved until about 2014. And it was solved using Sure enough, generalized hypergeometric functions. Yeah, no other proof, and there is, and the proof is actually quite short. It's only about um, six or seven pages. You know, nobody could believe it uh, that the proof was so short. And and to this day, there is only one proof known. And it, and you have to know you you have to know your um your confluent hypergeometric functions and your zero f ones and your one f twos. If you don't know that, you cannot solve this problem. So. I think the future of special functions is alive and well, and will always be alive and well. Yeah, sure. You are a very brave man, Donald, to tell Dick that. <laughs> you completely <laughs> disagreed with him. Well, well, when you see my talk, you'll, um, you know, the old saying is, um, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I just didn't realize that I was treading on a <laughs> thin ice, yes, but, but I survived, yeah. Yeah, and in and in some in and you know, Dick played a role in my surviving actually, but I'll say more later on during my talk. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? I think it's time to quit for lunch and we resume again at what? 1 30. 1 30. A little less than an hour from now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>